Say hello to a new friend on an old road. Take a two lane trip of memories into mysteries unknown. Come along for the ride. Jim Hinckley's America. Jim Hinckley's America. Hey, good morning, everyone. It is 77 delightful degrees here at uh, the studios of Jim Hinckley's America in Kingman, Arizona. It's going to be a hot one today. I am always get a kick out of the uh, weather reports this time of year. That was a little bit of music from Joe and Woody and the boys, the road crew, roadcrew66.com. Great road trip inspiring music is their specialty. You know, we uh, we were talking about uh, the, the weather forecast. It, they always come up with things like uh, excessively warm or things of that nature. It's called summer in the southwest. Still, it's going to be about 105 here in Kingman today, which is perfect temperature to go downtown and try out new scoops on 66 between 2nd and 3rd Street downtown Kingman along Route 66. Uh, Tim and Lenore have been tenacious, and they finally got it open. This is in a uh, 1930s cafe that has been closed for decades. It's great to see this come to life. It's part one of a three-part project that they've got going. And speaking of the road crew and road trips, well, that's kind of what we're going to talk about today, but eh, we're going to kind of blend the past and a little bit of the present, maybe the future. We have our old friends with us, Mike and Jessica, this morning from the Historic Electric Vehicle Foundation. Hey, folks, how are you doing? You're in Gallup this morning? Yes, we are. Okay. I hope you can Lovely little Gallup. You were breaking well, up we for can. a second. Yeah, we've, uh, I've been dealing with uh, power outages this morning, uh, all kinds of fun things. Oh, oh so how's, how's things in Gallup? <laughs> well, um, surprisingly calm for a Saturday night last night. We tried to get dinner and kept striking out because it was after 9 p.m. Oh. I, I think the town goes to bed somewhere around 9.15. You know, that's that's one of the challenges with small town America. I always ha I run into that problem a lot when I stay like in Shamrock, Texas or McLean, Texas, for that matter. Yeah, that's true. So yeah, you folks, uh, go ahead, Mike. Oh, I was going to say, when we travel, we pack so much stuff into the day that a lot of times we get to our hotel maybe 7 or 8 o'clock at night, and then dinner is hard to find because most places have already closed. Yeah. God. Judy and I travel with a, a picnic basket, among other things. So uh, you made another like trip with a Tesla. Yeah, uh, another great Route 66 trip with the Tesla. I noticed there in Oklahoma, I think it was Oklahoma, you were trying out the uh, off-road capabilities of the Tesla. How did that work <laughs> out? Well, well, it was it was still a road. It was just a very wet road, and and very dirty wet road. So it was it was kind of squishy mud. Yeah, it was that that clay like stuff. We went through a, a few good puddles, and then about the fourth one we got to. It's like, this one's a little worse. We could still do it okay. But then I look down the road and I see what it looks like about 100 feet of just water. No road left. So we decided to turn around at that point. Had to make one of those 17-point yeah. U-turns. Uh, I, I know that Tesla, and especially with my, my association with you folks, have shown me that Teslas are very capable vehicles. Uh, but I don't think uh, I've heard much about their amphibious qualities. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I have seen a couple of videos where they're full on like two feet deep water. They're more floating and the wheels are just kind of acting as uh, propellers to get them through the water. But I don't want to put my car through that. I have no. to drive that car every day to work. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> you know, that's a, that's a, you have to take that into consideration when, uh, your primary, it's your primary vehicle. You can't be as abusive as you would otherwise, yeah. or if you have yeah, the money to buy there. several other vehicles. So how was, uh, you went to the AAA Route 66 Road Fest uh, in Tulsa. Man, that looked like a great event. Pretty well received. Pretty well attended. Um, yeah, it, it was a lot of fun. There were, there were quite a lot of people there. The venue, the Expo Center in Tulsa was absolutely huge. Um, thankfully the power got back on there before the event started, they were still, uh, mopping up for a couple of days in, in the rest of the town, but you know, it, it worked itself out as the, uh, road fest went on, but it was all indoors. So we got out of the, uh, heat and humidity, including the car show. It was great that the car show was indoors for, for all the folks with their classic cars. Well, you know, uh, Wade Bray, one of the fellow's uh, primary organizers uh, behind this, the, the head cat wrangler, I guess you would call him. Uh, boy, he's got big plans for the next couple of years with that road fest, including some centennial stuff that he's working on. So that's that's pretty exciting. Yeah, it is. They this want was... to move it from town to, you know, to different cities. And uh, we'd love to have them uh, in California at one of those times, too. I have talked to him a little bit about that somewhere in the L.A. area. One of the problems, of course, is the expense of venues becomes an issue. Uh, right. And uh, this event, uh, he requires about 60,000 square feet minimum uh, to put this together in its entirety. And it's tough to yeah. find a venue of that size. Yeah, it is. And, I mean, the... Part of the festival is kind of a museum exhibit of uh, Route 66 and transportation over the decades. It takes up a lot of space and it's really, really cool. You know, plus you've got vendors, you've got uh, Route 66 associations, you know, nonprofit kind of areas, uh, tourism organizations, and there was a mini golf and, and a bunch of other kids activities. So there's a lot to pack in there. And yeah, they need a ton of space. Yeah, it looked like a great event. Uh, we had uh, we managed to pull off getting some Kingman representation. Uh, uh, Tim Webb, who has uh, Tin Can Music, was there, and he graciously offered to promote our uh, downtown historic district walking tour. Uh, we were very very pleased by that. Uh, were you the only representative on the electric vehicle contingent, or did you have company? Um. I think it was just us. Well, we kind of had company in the form of uh, the Oklahoma City Power Company. Uh, they had a booth right next to us. They did have a uh, Leaf, a Nissan Leaf that they were showing off. Um, but considering the power was still out for many Tulsans, uh, they they probably were not as well received as they would have liked. Yeah. They, they did say they had a lot of people thanking them for the work that they were putting in to get everybody back up though. Well, that's so, good. so yeah, they, they were there. So I, I kind of forgot about that. <laughs> they were in a leaf next to us. We were the only ones that were like EV travelers. All right. Well, you were uh, also representing uh, the historic electric vehicle foundation. Is that correct? Or, um, I didn't kind have of. a lot of uh, information to give out for the HEVF. I asked for some, you know, uh, promotional stuff, but they're still working on current stuff. So right, I wasn't right. able to, to do very much on that end without uh, materials to give out to folks. Yeah. So we had um, ha our, our table was kind of half California Route 66 Association and half Route 66 EV Association and and Electric Route 66. All informational. We let the uh, Texas and Oklahoma associations on either side of us um, uh, overshadow us with a plethora of information since they're so closer and they had uh, easy guides to sell and pins and, and uh, other stuff that folks could buy from them to support them. But we were just informational. We did spend a lot of time, though, speaking with a lot of people 
um, <clears throat> it was it was really actually quite great. There were a lot of people that we st that we talked to that we were able to answer questions for and kind of give them a little bit more clarity on on driving an electric vehicle and road tripping in an electric vehicle. There are a lot of misconceptions out there that you know you can't take a road trip in an EV. You, you you'll spend hours charging and and we were really able to kind of help people understand that that's not always the case and uh, road tripping and especially road tripping on Route 66 um, is really quite doable in an electric vehicle and when you're not spending as much money on fuel costs, you've got more money to spend on museums and souvenirs and t-shirts and coffee mugs. <laughs> And books by Jim Hinckley. And, things and that books nature. by and Jim books Hinckley. Like, we might have one of those in the truck right now. Yeah. Like, ooh, I don't recognize this one. I'll get it. Have you signed uh, yep. it when we get back? Yes, by all means. My signature is not worth much on checks, but I deface books on a regular basis. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I find the parallels really fascinating. Uh, I was recently given a book, gifted a book, on motoring in the West, uh, 1901 to 1912. And the parallels between the challenges and the misinformation that motorists faced during that period and what electric vehicle owners face today is really fascinating. We hear so much about uh, infrastructure issues. You know, there's not enough charging and things. And this is identical to what, was, what motorists were facing it was real and perceived problems of motoring, you know, a hundred years ago. And uh, yeah, it's changing so fast. How many trips have you made along Route 66 now with your Tesla, may I ask? Oh, I, I couldn't even count. We go to California and Arizona a lot. Um, probably uh, two or three major trips beyond that. We went to Illinois last year um we went uh let's see we've i know we've done at least four maybe five really good uh long road trips that are over a thousand miles um in the tesla um because we've gone back to crescent city my hometown in california um at least twice in the tesla and so that's about 1,800 miles round trip. And then we've come out uh, east three times because we did Neon Fest, we did MopCon, and now we've done oh, yes. um, uh, road, the AAA Road Fest. Yeah, so... Will you be attending the Miles of Possibility Conference this year? Mm -hmm. Whoops. Well, will you be attending the Miles of Possibility Conference this year? I'm not sure. <laughs> that's that's going to depend largely upon um, our our regular uh, jobs uh, schedules, basically. <laughs> yeah. yeah, whether we don't can you, work in the vacation time. Don't you just hate it that work interferes with life? Very much so. Yes. Very, but, very much so. I do work from home, and a lot of my job could actually be done from the road from pretty much anywhere. Uh, all I would need is an internet connection, but it's a matter of actually having that uh, paid time off so that I can actually afford the trip. <laughs> yeah. Well, we get used to eating on a regular basis. That gives us incentive to keep working. Exactly. But, uh, yes. but it does get frustrating. Uh, your website, uh, your uh, electric uh, Route 66 website, I find that just, a, I know, you know, you, you post things as your schedule allows, mm -hmm. uh, but I find that website to be just extremely fascinating. Well, thank you very much. You yeah. know, I, I, I got into posting up dash cam videos because it was something that nobody else uh, could do in quite the same way because our car has four cameras on it and I put the videos together to have four views of driving on Route 66 at the same time. Um, and also it takes less writing to do an article to say as I put up a new video. Um, on this trip, we did a bunch of YouTube videos. I haven't linked them yet on the .com because we're traveling and I, I don't have time to write up the thing, but uh, Electric Route 66 is also a YouTube channel. And so all those videos are up. I did them live completely raw when I could. And, and when I couldn't, I, I still just kind of recorded them raw and 
uh, uploaded them when I had enough signal to do so. But then I love yes. the informational portion of that stuff as well, trying to let people know, you know, you can take a road trip. These are This is the information you kind of need. And then letting the small businesses know, you know, hey, all you really need to do is, is one or two small things to attract the electric vehicle drivers, and then they'll come flocking into your doors. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's, it's adapting. It's, uh, I haven't, uh, I don't have a lot of experience driving or being around electric vehicles. And I know there would be a learning curve. I'm used to driving things like this old 51 Chevy and this old Jeep. And it, it's a different animal. Uh, just like driving a Model T is totally different from driving, well, my 98 Jeep Cherokee. They're, they're different animals. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I think people, uh, they have a tendency to uh, uh, have trouble with change. I think that's one of the biggest obstacles. And uh, you and uh, Mike and Jessica, you have, have really uh, done a great job educating people and gently nudging them and encouraging them to, at least look at this from a rational perspective. Well, thank you. Um, that That's really kind of the whole point of the thing is like, I, I didn't get uh, into electric vehicles from a high minded attitude. I wanted to save money. I need a car yeah. and, and I want to spend as little on it as, as I can. And I spend a lot of money on gas. So you know, when we needed something around town, uh, when our oldest was driving and going to school and, and we needed another car to facilitate that stuff, electric was the natural choice because we wasn't going out of town. Short range was fine and it was cheap. And then um, at the same time, I'm looking at, you know, down the road, our next car can we do this with electric and save the money on gas? And the answer was yes. And so we just went ahead and did it. The car itself is a bit of a splurge. That's more money than I spent on a car. We never bought a brand new car before either. But but you have to consider um, pretty much the, the only maintenance is, is changing the washer fluid and the blinker fluid. <laughs> well, yes, and muffler bearings can be a problem. Yes, I got to check those soon. You know, I, I, I really like the way you do this. Uh, you always encourage people to, to look at the car. You know, I, I jokingly refer to you folks as EV evangelist. But this is a, <laughs> this is the changing face of, uh, of travel. You know, it's just, it really is. It doesn't matter if we like it or not. The point is, things are changing. And uh, we can get a little excited about that. You add, with your road trips and your postings, uh, your off-road adventures, you uh, add that sense of excitement and adventure that attracts people's attention to this. And um, I hope Mr. Musk is listening because he really should be paying you guys. But, <laughs> <laughs> well, if he would agree, we would agree. But, you know. <laughs> I didn't, th I didn't think he'd argue. The jobs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how's the trip gone for you? I know there's been a lot of storms uh, through Oklahoma, Missouri, Kansas. We've, we've largely avoided storms. We've only even just got rained on briefly a couple times. They, they've yeah. kind of run through when we haven't been driving, like overnight or, or stuff like that. I mean, there hasn't been that much. The car is filthy. Oh, we've, yeah. we've got bugs from many different states all over it now. Yes, I'm very we good. off for the for the road fest. We, you know, it was on display inside the venue as as part of the show. So we cleaned it off pristine for the show, and now it's just like it was on our way in, absolutely covered in st stuff. the The bugs are more uh, um, evident than all the water spots. I've got a couple questions people have asked. Uh, now that you've been, you've driven your car quite a lot, uh, battery life, are you seeing, uh, uh, any real decrease in range as the batteries age? It's, it's down about 15%, which I mean, I follow along in Tesla groups and stuff and 15% is more than typical. Usually it's five to 10%. And that's possibly due to us pushing it hard. We drive it down to 
under 10 miles sometimes on a trip or like uh the chart we'll get there with 10 miles of range left to plug in or have dinner or whatever and so we will push it there a lot more than than most people do so the range is uh, about 270 miles now when originally it was 310 so it's not something that we've um had a, had a lot of trouble with right it's just a little lower you know like a, when a car gets older and the, and the sure. miles per gallon goes down over time yeah uh, the other one is uh since you live in uh here in the southwest uh do you find the heat uh in the summer affects uh, the range more so than like winter Honestly, no. Winter affects the range more because using the heater uh, drains the battery power way more than using the air conditioner. Using the air conditioner is just like, you know, powering a compressor, no big deal. But using the heater to generate the heat, <clears throat> excuse me, um, really can, can drain the battery power on, on a vehicle. I mean, it's not going to significantly make it so that you can't take a road trip, but... So, yeah, in in the colder areas, the the heat can can be a factor. But in the southwest, the warmer doesn't really have a lot of effect. It's it's hard to even notice. It will still kill your twelve volt though. Yes, <laughs> our car still has a regular twelve volt battery, like any gas car, and you know those last about three years in the southwest. Yeah. So I, I was, we'll, see, we'll see if it makes it through this summer. I think this is its third summer on the current 12 volt battery. I was just reading an article. I believe it was Sweden. Uh, about 60% of new cars being sold now are electric vehicles. Oh yeah. And I think it was like Norway is something like 80 or 90%. You know, and those are very cold climates. I don't yeah. think they have as far to drive as we do in the Southwest. So they right. can, they can use some of that extra range for their heat. <laughs> one more question i have here that somebody sent was required requ when it comes time to change uh what's the the procedure uh time wise cost of uh changing the batteries in a tesla um well they're on the bottom so it's not terribly complicated to do but it's kind of one of those things that we haven't really worried about the warranty on a battery on the main battery is like a powertrain warranty on a car. It's minimum eight years and a hundred thousand miles. So it's kind of like, you know, do you, when you buy a gas car, do you worry about what it costs to get a new engine and transmission eight years from now? It's not you really know, something you think about. I suppose those questions are asked because, uh, uh, it's like there again, it's different. It's not a gas yes. car. And so people think different. Uh, they, right. Got, uh, this, uh, well, for lack of a better term, ignorance. Uh, ignorance about electric vehicles in general. But of course, as we know, information like you provide, ignorance can be cured. <laughs> Unfortunately, stupidity, not a damn thing you can do about it. <laughs> well, there there is that. But I, I fully understand the question. And I really think that people... Um, I think it's a valid question, quite honestly. I mean, as Mike said, you don't worry when you're buying a gas car, you know, no. how much is it going to cost me to replace the engine or the transmission eight years from now. But at the same time, with an electric car, um, because it is so new, people are thinking more about that. Um, and I think that electric cars have been around for a while, but they haven't been as popular with with the general population for long enough for us to see the the real process that's going to come about for changing out a battery in an electric vehicle. I mean, we had the uh, recall with the batteries on the Chevy Bolt. Um, and on that, the, the cost was, you know, minimal to the Bolt customers because it was all covered under warranty. They just, you know, make an appointment with a Chevy dealer, bring in their Bolt, get a different car to drive for a while, um, and then come back and pick up their Bolt. Um, my niece went through that with her Bolt, and I think she was using a rental car for, or, or a, a, a car that was provided by Chevy for her, for like a week maybe 
And she just made sure to let them know that when she did get a, a vehicle from them, she wanted it to be an electric vehicle also because she didn't want to spend any money on gas. And and they accommodated her and, and it went quite smoothly. Um, I know for people when they change out the battery in a leaf, um, the process is a little bit different. So I'm sure it's going to be a little bit different also for a Tesla. Uh, it'll be different whether your battery is under warranty or whether it's not under warranty. The batteries can be pretty expensive, but then again, so is a new transmission or a, or a new engine for yes. your car. So um, it's 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 comparable, is what I would say. Yeah, it's an apples and oranges thing, you know. It's, it's like you said, it's um, it's the same thing, just different, basically. Whether you replace a transmission or batteries, you mentioned. Much. You mentioned that electric vehicles have been around for quite a while. I've always been puzzled. Uh, electric vehicles have, gosh, in the late 1890s, they had electric buses and taxi cabs on the streets of New York. And electric vehicles, in my opinion, have always been practical for urban use. But it's only really recently that we've got to a point where they're uh, relatively practical for, for actual travel. That is what's new about electric vehicles. I agree. Yeah. So how's things on Route 66? Is it, is, are we, does it look like the businesses are, are recovering from the apocalypse? COVID sure created havoc out there. I think so, yeah. There's, uh, there's quite a lot of people out there. We saw lots of foreign travelers. Um, I think uh, Bob Lyle in Texas was telling us uh, that uh, folks aren't spending quite as much on things like souvenirs because they're spending more on gas and overnight stays and thing, you know, those kind of costs have gone up. So there's still a little bit of recovery yet to do, but there's a lot of people out there and Oh my goodness. We went to the big Texan oh. to, just to get some souvenirs. It wasn't even time to eat. It was so packed. We wanted to get out of there immediately to make room for everyone else. It's I think, amazing. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, I think one of the things that COVID has done is make us all a little bit shy of uh, large groups of people. So, <laughs> so, so going we, into a big place was a little bit scary. Yeah, we we got used to less people around, and and there's there's lots in a lot of places. Well, there, you know, there hardly were any anywhere that didn't have somebody else there also visiting on any of these places on sixty six. The COVID didn't change that too much for Judy and I, because we're professional hermits and uh, we're not uh, fans of big crowds. So uh, yeah, we've always kind crowds, of been. Crowds work us out. Yeah. It's, I guess with COVID though, it makes you a little more nervous. I, I, I know what you're saying. I go in a restaurant that's really packed and I start feeling as about as anxious as nervous as a long tail cat in a room full of rocking chairs. And it makes me a little bit edgy. Guys, I want to thank you for doing this, and I want to thank you for, uh, well, uh, not only promoting Route 66, because, but uh, also the EV. How's the, uh, the, the uh, California Electric, uh, uh, California Historic Route 66 Association? Uh, you know, you started, speaking of COVID, uh, you folks started that uh, monthly series of Zoom programs. And I know that that's been, in general, plagued with problems, Zoom in general, but you you folks have really turned that into something, a Thank valuable you. asset to the Route 66 community. And yeah, for everybody who's challenge. involved with that, congratulations. That's a great yeah. project. You know, um, Scott, the president of the association, and, and the other board members have all been really supportive of keeping the Zoom going to keep uh, information flowing about stuff on 66 and in general and California in particular to – just keep encouraging people to go out and and do the things that you can do out there. You know, during COVID, there wasn't as much, and now everything is coming back, and there's still lots to talk about every month. So we've been trying to keep it going, and, you know, it, it's a wide audience you can reach when you're doing a Zoom presentation instead of having uh, – you know, only on-site stuff to give people information about. Well, your, your last uh, your last program is a perfect example. Having Marian Pavel from Bratislava, Slovakia, 
on your program talking mm-hmm. about you know the his endeavors the route 66 navigation app the passport uh yeah it opens a, just a wide array of doors and it's really important because california there again just like with electric vehicles you have real problems and magnified problems through perception uh Mm -hmm. and california gets short shift a lot among route 66 enthusiasts and it's one of the more interesting segments of the highway because you have the emptiest stretch of highway out there in the mojave desert and probably the most congested stretch in the the la metro area so you've got such a a diverse range of driving conditions with uh, Route 66 in uh, california and that's one of the challenges for for uh, promoting 66 in California also. You've got the, the desert areas that have some wonderful things to see, but not a lot of people there who are local to promote them. And then in the busy areas, you've got so many things going on, so much to see and do that Route 66 is, is uh, very, very uh, in the background compared to everything else. And so, and so the people, you know, tons of people who can support, but they're supporting other things. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a challenge because like say traffic, well, traffic's been a problem in Southern California since at least World War II. It's just something you learn to deal with. Uh, I, I have trouble in any town with more than three stoplights, but uh, th- thanks to Scott Piotrowski and others, uh, I, I've managed to figure out ways to kind of, especially from San Bernardino to downtown LA, I figured out how to get through that on Route 66 with less traffic problems than I deal with in Kingman. From mm. downtown LA to Santa Monica, I haven't quite figured out how to beat the traffic there yet, but yeah, yeah what you, the hell? It's part of the adventure. You kind of, you know, shoot for Sunday morning and and just deal with whatever happens. <laughs> yeah, that's it. And you know, you mentioned uh, the small places that there's nobody to promote. You know, Daggett, California is a perfect example. Daggett is just an extremely fascinating town. Uh, but yeah, there's lots of historical uh, um, attractions there, you know, just to, just to stop by and take a look at. One of the ones I've been chasing is a kind of a persistent urban legend, if you will. Well, I guess urban's kind of stretching the point since we're talking about Daggett. Uh, <laughs> but I understand, uh, I do know that the Earp family, uh, Wyatt Earp and whatnot, had uh, ranching a- activities in that area and also were involved in some of the mining. But what I've not been able to verify is that Mr. Earp apparently ran the faro tables there at the Stone Hotel for a while. Oh, wow. But, but I have been hearing this quite a lot. And so I've been trying to pin down those stories. Uh, Jessica, Mike, thank you again for doing this this morning. And what, thanks for what you're doing in general on Route 66 and with the EV evangelism. Uh, I know you're probably anxious to get on the road to get home. And, <laughs> are you driving straight through today from Gallup? Um, to, today is, is about our longest travel day. Gallup to home, we're going to have to hit in one day because of all the stuff we did leading up to today. Um, it's about 450 miles back to our house. Yeah. So we were able to take it a lot slower on this trip on, on most of the days, which we were so thankful for. But well, we, how- we really want to thank you for having us on the show, Jim. It, it's, it's really, truly our pleasure to uh, speak to you anytime um, and to speak to anyone who wants to talk to us about either Route 66 or electric vehicles. Yeah, we were roadies before we were EV drivers and we're, we're, you know, neck deep in both of those worlds now. Well, I greatly enjoy the conversation with you two. Uh, I never find it shocking, but I do find it electrifying. And uh, <laughs> so anyway. Uh, That's one of the things on my uh, business cards is electrifying history. There you go. Whereas mine has semi-professional heckler. (laughs) Oh, well, Jessica, you're still young and semi-professional. I'm sure you can change that soon with a bit more practice. I'm sure you'll get very good at that. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) I have have confidence. Uh, Uh, 
guys, thank you. And like I say, travel safe. Uh, I noticed you were in Tucumcari, and that happens to be uh, not only one of our favorite places, but of course a sponsor of Jim Hinckley's America. Uh, you can find out more about Tucumcari at a uh, visit Tucumcari NM. And that's a town that uh, people notice the neon and they stay at the Roadrunner Lodge. And of course there's the famous Blue Swallow Motel, Motel Safari. But uh, boy, that town, it, it's got a, it's got, it's got some, it's got a pulse. It's alive. It's got some vibrancy. And yeah, uh, we were, you, we didn't want to leave. We, I mean, we checked out of our uh, room at the Motel Safari and, it was still noon before we managed to actually hit the road. <laughs> and and we still had a pile of things that we didn't even get to. We want to go back there and just spend a couple days just there. Yeah. I, I know we're running a little over, but uh, have you ever been to the Dinosaur Museum, Mesa Lens Community College Dinosaur Museum? No, I saw it there, but uh, um, the hours weren't uh, conducive on this trip. So it's it's one of the many things there that that we still have yet to uh, go into. It will surprise you. It's a Smithsonian quality exhibits. It's it's small, but it is uh, uh, Smithsonian quality exhibits there. And here's something uh, for Route 66 travelers. It's a little late this year, but Mesa Lands Community College that has the Dinosaur Museum also has a paleontology laboratory. And planning ahead for next year, if you want something different for a family adventure on Route 66, uh, they, they host digs, fossil digs, paleontology digs uh, in the Tucumcari area wow. that you can participate in. And, of course, there's a charge. It's a fundraiser for the college. But talk mm -hmm. about a great adventure for, for a family, Route 66, and go out and dig up some dinosaurs in the desert. Yeah, that sounds super cool. Mr. Delvin Harbor you know, was with us today. And, of course, Delvin is uh, with the California Route 66 Museum there in Victorville, California. Another highly recommended stop, guys. Uh, I jokingly and derisively refer to a lot of my California stops as uh, Needless California, Hysteria, and Victimville. But I hope everybody knows I'm joking because uh, I, I enjoy all three communities. And one reason I enjoy them is people like Delvin and the folks there at the California Museum. Yeah, that's a great museum. It's, it's worth a stop. Guys, time you go through. You take care and uh, drive careful. We'll talk again soon. Next yep. week, we're going to talk with um, author Ann Slanina about uh, her Annie Mouse series of books, how she came up with this idea and where she's been going with that and her road trips. So we'll have some fun next week. Guys, thank you for joining us this morning, and uh, I'll tell you, we'll do this thank again you. next week. Jessica, Mike, you take care and uh, travel safe. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Say hello to a new friend on an old road. Take a two-lane trip of memories into mysteries unknown. Come along for the ride. Jim Hinckley's America. Jim Hinckley's America. Guys, we had a great morning this morning. It's always great to visit with Mike and Jessica. We ran a few minutes late. I don't think anybody minded too much. Uh, next week, like I said, we're going to talk to author Ann Slanina about her Andy Mouse series and her fascinating road trips. Speaking of road trips, if uh, you want a trouble-free, you just want to get in the car and go have a great road trip, uh, take a look at uh, uh, Road Trip USA. They're the bespoke uh, road trip specialist for a grand adventure in the United States or Canada. And uh, I think you'll enjoy that immensely. And if you enjoy juvenile humor and you find yourself on Route 66 or in the Missouri Ozarks, uh, there's no place better to enjoy a good smile inducing adventure than Uranus, Missouri, near St. Robert. Uranus Fudge Company and General Store.
always a, a great, great adventure. And while you're there, well, you might as well spend the night in Cuba. Wagon Wheel Motel, the oldest continuously operated motel on Route 66, is just down the road from Uranus, just a spit and a jump. And uh, my friends, I want to thank you so very much for joining us. And, well, like I say, we'll talk to everybody next week. Adios, mi amigos. <laughs>